Welcome back. So this is the first video for chapter 12 in Intermediate Macroeconomics with me, uh, Professor Liam Malloy. And chapter 12 is going to introduce the concept of technological growth as a way to explain uh, long run growth. And we'll see that it's not a completely satisfying explanation for long run growth, especially the way we model it, but it is really the explanation for long run growth. Uh, we just have to, you know, understand what we mean by technological growth. And then we want to think sort of more um, sophisticatedly about uh, what that means and how we might put together a, a more sophisticated model. And, and economists have done that. Um, so what we saw in chapter 11 was that capital is extremely important for the level of economic output, right? We need more capital per worker to produce more. Um, but there is a, a golden rule level of capital where if we have more capital per worker, we actually reduce consumption because we have to invest so much uh, in order to uh, increase our capital. So increasing capital is not actually the way to um, long run growth. So we want to think about that and think about what we mean by technological progress and how that relates to uh, economic growth. So how do we model technological progress? So by technological progress in economics, what we mean is anything that allows us to produce more with fewer inputs. And so our major inputs are capital and technology. And so there are a couple ways to think about how we might model uh, this improvement in, in technological progress. Um, the way we're going to do it is we're going to create a variable A, which will be the state of technology. And we'll say that it is it augments labor, right? And so it makes labor more productive. Um, we could have one in front of labor and one in front of capital, or we could take A and put it in front of the production function, uh, which is also done. They're all similar um, with somewhat different uh, interpretations, um, but they're all sort of also, you know, deus ex machina solutions where we're kind of just saying, oh, this is technology that grows. We're just going to stick it in the production function and that's going to be growth. So not super satisfying. So we're going to put it in front of labor. So our production function now is a function of capital and AN, which we're going to call effective labor. And the nice thing about this model is that basically we can take the model from chapter 11, uh, make a few changes here in chapter 12 and get the same results, but that will have uh, growth in output per worker, uh, even if we don't have growth in output per effective worker. So let's look at our production function now. So we still have constant returns to scale. Um, and so if we increase capital and effective labor by the same amount X, then output will increase by X. And so if X equals one over a N, then we can write our output per effective worker as some function of capital per effective worker, right? So this is very similar to what we had in chapter 11 except instead of y over n and k over n, now we have y over a n and, cap and k over a n. So you can almost see like what's going to happen here, right? Is we're going to assume some growth rate in a uh, and therefore output per worker will grow by that amount and capital per worker will grow by that amount. Um, but capital per effective worker and output per effective worker will be constant in, in the steady state. So here's our production function and our output per effective workers on the vertical axis, our capital per effective workers on the horizontal axis, and we have this decreasing returns to capital per effective worker, which gives us our concave production function. Now, we are not going to have increases in uh, I mean, we, while we have sort of increases in technology, that's not going to shift our production function now the way it did before, um, because we already have technology in um, in the production function, right, as, as A. So, all right, so let's think about our how we add to capital and how we invest. 
And so remember that investment equals savings. And if, as long as we assume that public savings is zero, so taxes is equal to government spending, uh, then savings is equal to the savings rate, little s, uh, times y. And so investment per effective worker is now equal to the savings rate, little s, times output, which is a function of capital over uh, effective worker. Now, because we need to grow uh, the technology variable a, we can also grow the uh, labor variable n um, in the same kind of way. Uh, and so this gives us a little bit more realism because, you know, the labor force is growing in a country like the United States. Um, and of course, if it was shrinking, we could put a negative number in there. Um, so now, in order to sort of maintain our, our level of capital per effective worker, investment needs to be equal to uh, depreciation, delta, plus the growth rate in technology, G sub A, plus the growth rate in the population or the labor force, G sub N, all times K. So before we just had it equal to delta K, right? Because that was the only thing that was reducing capital. But now what's reducing capital per effective worker is not only depreciation delta, it's also the growth rate in technology and the growth rate in uh, the labor force. So we have to account for all three of them when we're thinking about our steady state. And so the, the picture is exactly the same. It's just the slope of uh, the straight line here, the required investment line um, that is now steeper because it's delta plus uh, GA plus GN. And so we have capital per effective worker on the horizontal axis. We have output per effective worker on the vertical axis. We have our same production function, but now it is, you know, as a function of capital per effective worker and it's output per effective worker rather than output per worker. Uh, we have our same investment function uh, and then we have our required investment line. And so if we're to the left of the place where our investment curve meets our required investment line, um, then that's going to increase our output per effective worker until we get to the equilibrium. If we are to the right, then depreciation and technological growth and population growth are going to push it to uh, the left and we will end up in our steady state. And so at our steady state, capital per effective worker is constant. Uh, and output per effective worker is constant. But that doesn't mean that capital per worker and output per worker are constant uh, because uh, they'll be growing at uh, G sub A. So if we think about growth in the steady state, right, we've just taken our model in chapter 11 where we had no growth in the steady state and we've added some technological piece and we said, okay, well, we have the same type of model, so capital per effective worker is constant and output per effective worker is constant at the steady state. But the effective worker is not a real worker, right? Effective workers don't eat, real workers eat. And so output per worker grows at the rate of technological progress, which is G sub A. Now, okay, this does maybe sort of match the, the data, right, where we do kind of grow at a fairly steady pace in the long run although it does change a bit, you know, decade by decade. Um, but we haven't explained anything, right? Because obviously the real question is, well, where does growth in technological progress come from? And we'll talk about that a little bit later uh, in the chapter and then in, in the semester. So if we think about this sort of what is often called a balanced growth path, um, we can say, okay, well, our steady state in our steady state, we have two things that are constant, capital per effective worker and output per effective worker. So those growth rates are both zero. But what we really care about is output per worker and capital per worker. Uh, those are growing at G uh, sub A. Labor, right, is growing at G sub N. And so that could be positive or negative or zero, depending on what's happening to the labor force. Capital itself, like the actual amount of capital we have in the economy, is growing at uh, G sub A plus G sub N. And output is growing at G sub A plus G sub N. So this kind of takes us back to uh, chapter mm, 8 and 9, where we talked about the natural rate of unemployment. And when we graphed 
uh, the Phillips curve um, and Oaken's law, it was really Oaken's law, we saw that what we needed um, for no change in the unemployment rate was about 3.2% growth every year to keep the unemployment rate just constant. And that 3.2%, that's really this G sub A plus G sub N. Um, and so that's, you know, that does make sense, right? We see that we need positive economic growth just to keep the unemployment rate constant. And that's because the labor force is growing, G sub N, and that's because uh, technological progress is improving, that's G sub A.